People have been storytellers for as long as we've been able to communicate. Stories are more than just a form of entertainment. They help us relate to one another, and hearing stories as a child creates emotional connections that helps us better understand each other and the world around us. It's impossible for everyone to share the same thoughts and feelings, but we can all relate to the core emotions that are shared among many of these experiences. The way we view our own lives is often similar to a redemptive narrative, where we go through different stages of our lives and frame the events in a continually developing narrative identity. According to Dan McAdams, narrative identity is defined as a person's internalized and evolving life story, integrating the reconstructed past and imagined future to provide life with some degree of unity and purpose. Kenneth Lonergan's 2011 film Margaret showcases a protagonist who embodies the core idea of this theory, and how the realization that everyone has their own narrative identity shapes the way we see the world. Margaret is about Lisa, a high schooler living with her mother in a small apartment in the Upper West Side. Lisa is what one might expect from a teenage girl in a Manhattan private school. She's opinionated, expresses herself hyperbolically, and is struggling to figure out her life before she goes to college. The fact that the main character is not all that special or particularly likable is a calculated choice on the part of the filmmakers. By choosing to focus on someone who is not usually the subject of a dramatic work, we get a sense that everyone has a story that is just as valid as the next person, and how a single event may ripple into people's lives in ways we never expected. Early on in the film, Lisa witnesses a horrific bus accident that she may be partly to blame for. The lady who was hit by the bus dies in Lisa's arms, and the aftermath of this incident is what Lisa has to reconcile with for the rest of the film. Lisa is overwhelmed by the world she is thrust into, and this accident sparks a lot of change in her understanding of herself and the people around her. One of the film's core themes is that everyone uses their experiences to form a personal narrative, and this narrative identity can often lead to selfishness, especially in people who lack the emotional capacity to deal with traumatic events. Well, you want to ruin my life? You want to start telling about looks and, and you waved at me and I had my cowboy hat on? Go ahead. But you're going to go back and do your homework and I'm going to lose my job. And who's going to take care of my family? You? Examining narrative identity through a young person is especially interesting because the transition from adolescence to adulthood is one of the most formative periods of your life. Our experiences begin to display an increasing amount of thematic coherence as we start to integrate the events of our lives and figure out who we really are. This can feel like an insurmountable task, especially as a young person who has so much left to learn. Lisa becomes very involved with the aftermath of the bus incident, but a close friend of the lady who died calls her out for drawing herself into something that is not about her. Because this is not an opera. What? I said this is not an opera. You think I think this is an opera? Yes. You think I think this is dramatic? I think you're very young. What does that have to do with anything? If anything, I think it means I care more than someone who's older because this kind of thing has never happened to me before. No. It means you care more easily. There's a big difference. This is one of the most important quotes of the film since it shows how Lisa has been making this situation about herself which she is not necessarily to blame for since she is trying her best to cope with a traumatic event by processing it all as a narrative. Lisa, I'm not doing anything. I'm a human being. Monica was a human being. So was her daughter and so is your mother. We are not supporting characters in the fascinating story of your life. I never said or thought you were. I feel so bad about what happened and I'm trying so hard to do something about it and I don't understand why if I say something wrong, you can't just give me a break. She is just learning how to properly relate to people, but is also overloaded with the immense amount of hardships and milestone events in her life. Margaret mostly focuses on a young person and their struggles with their identity, but the film argues that adults are no better at grappling with the same thing. Lisa's mother is shown as someone struggling to maintain a healthy relationship with her daughter, while also having trouble finding romantic love. Regardless of their age, Kenneth Lonergan frames the characters as human beings just trying to get through life in a world that doesn't stop to hold their hand. The setting of New York City is a perfect backdrop for this kind of story, where even walking at a normal pace may get you knocked over by the constant flow and frenzy of the city. People seem to always be walking from one place to another, but nobody knows where the person next to them is going. The sound design of Margaret is a key tool for representing the overwhelming amount of stories around Lisa. Lisa's conversations are drowned out by the other conversations around her, giving significance to the passerby in her life and showing that her story is not uniquely important. 
These scenes are fundamental in the film's attempt to convey this idea of Sonder, or the realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own. That particular technique or trick that you're talking about is a, a big, big part of the movie, and it was part of the movie in the script phase. Right away, there's a scene in a diner where you're hearing an important teenage conversation on, with the main characters, and then side by side in the script, you're hearing the conversation of the two women in the booth right next to them. And that, that turned out to be a really important element or theme or constituent of the movie, which is how much life is going on all around the main character that has nothing to do with her. Margaret frames the main characters in a way where various people, vehicles, and obstructions go in front of the camera, as if the characters are disappearing into an endless sea of consciousness. In many of these scenes, the operatic score permeates the film with a narrative quality, showing us that these intertwining everyday events are something cinematic and worthy of a story. The film seems to be viewing the characters from a divine perspective, as if it is trying to pull away from Lisa and show us that her story is not a unique experience, and that every human has a personal narrative that defines how they see the world. This idea is captured in a scene where Lisa's English class is discussing the following line from King Lear. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods. They kill us for their sport. I think he's saying that human beings don't mean any more to the gods than flies do to little boys who like to torture them for fun. Like as far as the gods are concerned, we're just ants. Nothing. In response, a student argues that maybe he's comparing human consciousness to divine consciousness and that even though it seems to us that human suffering is just arbitrary, that's just because we're limited by our viewpoint. Although the teacher refutes this point, this line is key for understanding what Margaret is saying about consciousness. The degree to which someone experiences suffering is completely dependent on their personal experiences, and trying to comprehend things from a grand or divine perspective is impossible. This is clear in how the film focuses on the events in Lisa's life. Going to a party or worrying about a math test is given just as much attention as the bus accident, showing how these seemingly meaningless things are given so much dramatic weight in our lives. Yeah, I'm gonna say it. I feel really fucked over by some of the people in this room. And I'm not saying I'm not gonna do my job, but for some reason, a lot of the actors in the show seem to think that this whole show is about them. Overall, Margaret conveys the idea that even though everyone feels like the main character in their own story, the world does not treat us this way. This internalized self-dramatization is inherently selfish, but what can we do about it? We're the heroes of our own self-narratives, but in doing so, we tend to ignore the fact that everyone else is in the same position. Margaret doesn't have a direct answer to this inherent dilemma, but like all art, it provides an experience that may help us understand a part of ourselves from a new perspective. In the final scene of the film, Lisa and her mother attend an opera where they are quickly overwhelmed by the power of the musical story on display. They cry into each other's arms and use the performance as a cathartic release for all of the emotions that have been building throughout the film. Margaret argues that even in situations that are bigger than any of us, when the world seems to be collapsing at every step, stories and art can at least help bring some of the pieces together and give meaning to the opera of life. Now no matter, child. Sorrow's springs are the same. It is the blight man was born for. It is Margaret you mourn for.